This is Dr. Ray Henry, and thank you for joining us on the Moment of Destiny broadcast. For several weeks, we've been preaching through the Gospel of John, and we've been highlighting the seven miracles that John highlights. Today, we look at the healing of the nobleman's son. The nobleman is desperate and determined to find Jesus. He finds him, and oh, what a difference Jesus makes in their lives. The nobleman shows us the pathway into the miraculous. So listen closely. Thank you for joining us in worship here at Belvedere Baptist Church. Thank you for those that are watching by television. We are still in the Gospel of John, our series of sermons in the Gospel of John. Today, we look at message number 10. It is the miracle of a nobleman's son. Uh, this man was a government official, but he had problems. He had difficulties. Everybody has difficulties and problems and dangers and desperate situations. And he has one chance of intervening in his son's life, and that is to find Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ come to his home, his humble home. He lived in the city of Capernaum. But he heard that Jesus was coming back up to Galilee from Jerusalem. He had been ministering in Jerusalem. Now he's traveling back up north on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And he is in the town of Cana. And somehow or another, uh, the communication wasn't that bad in that day. The nobleman, who had people in different parts of that country, got word to him that Jesus was coming back to Galilee and that he was in the city of Cana. You remember Cana is where he did that first miracle of changing the water into wine, taking care of an embarrassing situation. That was his first miracle. Now, the Bible says that this one that he does with the nobleman's son was his second miracle. And most likely he's saying this is the second miracle that he did at Cana because it's about a nine month to a year uh, uh, distance there as far as time, days and months. Some say it's approximately nine to one year. The other gospels has other miracles in there. So when it says this is the second miracle, he's probably referring to the second miracle at the town of Cana. So let's pick up the story here. And John, the fourth chapter, began reading at verse 46, the miracle of the nobleman's son. And we'll talk about why God does miracles. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee. It's on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. Once more, he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay dying. He was sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and he begged him to come and heal his son because he was close to death. Unless you see the miracle, unless the, you people see miracles, Jesus said to the man, signs and wonders, you will never believe. All you want to see is a miracle, Jesus is saying. The royal official said, sir, come down at once before the child dies. Jesus replied, you may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. And while he was still on the way, his servant met him with the news that his son was living. When he inquired as to what time he got better, uh, they said to him, the fever left him yesterday about the seventh hour, 7 p.m. at night. Then the father realized that this was the exact time which Jesus said to him, your son will live. So he and all of his household believed. This was the second miracle, miraculous sign, that Jesus performed having come from Jerusalem, Judea area, back up, which would be back down. In some ways, you go down from Jerusalem, down the hills, but you go back up north to Sea of Galilee and to the city of Cana, probably the second miracle at Cana. Why in the world do we even have miracles? Especially these uh, messianic miracles, many call these messianic miracles that Jesus performed. Why do we have miracles? Number one, 
Miracles show his deity, Christ's deity. They authenticate that he is God in the flesh, that he is the Christ, the Messiah. The Messiah would come and not only would he do miracles, just regular, ordinary, normal miracles, but he would do what is called messianic miracles. Miracles that nobody else could perform. Raising at least three dead people from death. Healing a man that had been crippled for 38 years. Healing a man that had been blind from birth. And you could go on and on and on. These were super, supernatural miracles. They were called messianic miracles. They authenticated that Jesus and Jesus alone was the Messiah. Now, if you're looking forward to the Messiah, some faiths are still looking for the Messiah to come. Well, he will have to duplicate the miracles of Jesus. If you're still looking for the Messiah, he, that person you're looking for, will have to duplicate these messianic miracles. So, miracles prove his deity. Number two, miracles prove his power. When one experiences a miracle of God, it shows people that God is real and God's alive and He's the Savior. A friend of mine named Blitz, Blitz worked for three presidents in Washington, D.C. He worked for the CIA. He was not religious at all, but his wife was, and, and she was involved in many home groups where they studied the Bible and they prayed, but not Blitz. He wasn't interested in that. Uh, he was interested in civil service, and he was a great civil servant, and he, he was a great servant to three of the major presidents. Blitz had developed a big tumor on his nose, and they couldn't do anything with it. And uh, one night when the wife came in from Bible study, evidently there were some of the other students there, the other members of her Bible study, and they asked her husband, Blitz, Blitz, uh, can we pray for that tumor on your nose? And, and uh, he said, okay, what have I got to lose? And so they prayed for that tumor on Blitz's nose. And you know what happened a couple of days later? That tumor just fell off of his nose, fell off of his nose. Now, Blitz knew that that was not the normal way to get rid of this tumor. He was facing surgery and, and probably maybe some chemo if it was cancer, so forth and so on. But here after they prayed, just a few days after they prayed, uh, Blitz says that tumor fell off. He began to seek the Lord and he found the Lord and he became a very dedicated Christian. He retired here in Palm Beach and he got working for the sheriff department, helping with uh, how, to, how to overcome the gang problem here in Palm Beach County. He worked with the sheriff and uh, overcame some of the problems that we were facing in our communities with the gang problems. Uh, Blitz saw that Jesus was the Christ. So miracles prove his deity. Miracles prove his power. Miracle proves his compassion that he loves us. He loves us. My son, when he was in college, developed something that was a rare disease called the Klein-Levison syndrome that shut him down for a whole week once a year. They didn't know where it came from or where it went. But he had a lot of people praying for him and he had some good doctors. And all of a sudden, after a couple of years, that Klein-Levison syndrome disappeared, just disappeared as quickly as it came. It showed my son God's love and God's compassion towards him. So today we see the miracle of the nobleman's son. Here was a high ranking Roman official. He worked for either the king or he worked for the governor. We're not sure exactly. It doesn't say exactly who he worked for in the government, but he, he was a nobleman that worked for one of the official people uh, in that day. Now, his home was in Capernaum, and that's where his son was living, and his son was on his deathbed, and his dad was right there with him, and his only hope was Jesus Christ and he heard that Jesus Christ was coming back to Galilee. That was his home. As a matter of fact, if you go to Israel today, there's a big sign that says Capernaum. Capernaum, 
the hometown of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus came back to Cana, and before he could get to Capernaum, he stayed at Cana, where the first miracle occurred. Well, the nobleman heard that Jesus was at Cana. And Cana was about 20 miles north on the west side of the Sea of Galilee. And this nobleman traveled up there so he could have a first-hand encounter, conversation with Jesus. And that's what we read about here. He finds Jesus there in Cana of Galilee where that first miracle occurred. And he says, please, sir, please. He begged him. He entreated him to come to his hometown of Capernaum, just 20 miles away, and touch his son and pray for his son and heal his son. So what do we see in this miracle? Number one, it was a desperate situation. God puts us in desperate situations in order to get our attention. What kind of desperate situation are you in today? Maybe you're going through some financial crisis. You don't have a, a, enough money to pay all those bills at the end of the month. Maybe you're going through a divorce or a separation. It looks very bleak and it's, it's heart rendering in your home today. Your marriage is about to break up and about to fold up. It could be one of your kids has gone astray and now he's on drugs. And these drugs today, fentanyl and other drugs, they're fatal. Just a tiny bit of them can kill. There's hundreds of thousands of our young people who are killed by the drugs that are on the streets today. I don't know what your desperate situation is, but this man, this nobleman had a desperate situation. His son is dying. There is only one hope, and that's to find Jesus and get Jesus to come and to pray for him. So that's the first thing that we see here is that the nobleman is facing a desperate situation. And before you will come to Christ, you have to be put into a desperate situation. Whatever you're going through today, that difficulty, that strain on your relationship, that financial problem, whatever it is, whatever's put you in desperation today, that was put there on purpose, on purpose to draw you unto God. I like to tell people God is a good prop knocker out from under her. No, that's not good English. I know it's not good English. But God knocks the props out from under us and puts us in desperate situations in order for us to come to Jesus Christ. He allows it on purpose, just as he did with the nobleman's son. So first of all, we see a desperate situation. Second, we see a desperate search for Jesus because he was put in this great difficulty. Can you imagine kneeling by the bedside of your son, and he has only so many hours left, or he's going to die unless somebody intervenes in this disease or problem, whatever he has, and he's kneeling there, and his only hope is Jesus Christ, and he hears he's coming back to town, he's coming back to Galilee, and he probably runs to find Jesus. He hears he's in Cana, and so he goes there, and he's determined to find Jesus. He is determined to get an answer to his prayers, and that is to find Jesus and to bring Jesus back to Capernaum and to, for him to lay hands on him and to heal his son. So for us to see a miracle, there has to be a desperate situation and there has to be a determination to find Jesus. He heard of Christ and then he searched for Christ until he found him. Have you done that? Has your desperate situation led you to seek after Jesus Christ? Thomas and Sarah Vargas was, she was the sister of a friend of mine, uh, P. N. Curian. Dr. P. N. Curian was over all of the education in India at one time. And then he went into ministry. And I was visiting in his home back in 1979 and 1980. And he had there his sister and her husband, Thomas and Sarah Vorgas, missionaries to Nepal. And in Nepal, it was against the law to spread the gospel, to give out tracts, to give out Bibles. It was against the law to convert uh, from Hinduism uh, into Christianity. It was against the law to baptize anybody. 
It was against the law to preach the gospel. I said, how in the world did you, did you, did you share Jesus with people if all of Christianity was against their laws? He says, well, our children would get sick and we would lay hands on them and they, they would get well. Their children would get sick and they would come to us with their children and ask us to pray for their children or a family member that was sick and we would pray for them and God would intervene. And then they were able to ask us questions freely. It was not against the law. They could ask us to tell them about our religion, but we could not openly share the gospel in the, in the marketplace. And when they would ask us about our Christianity, we were able to tell them if they asked first. And they saw the healing of their family members and they saw the healing of our family members and they asked about Jesus Christ. They wanted to know about Jesus Christ there in Nepal where it was against the law to convert over to Christianity. And today there are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians in Nepal. So first of all, they heard about Christ and then they came to Jesus Christ. I like this quote. You need to hear this today. Somebody needs to hear this. Let's listen to us here in this audience locally or there in TV land. You cannot just drift into a relationship with Christ. It is not just a chance encounter, a happen chance. Jesus said very clearly, come unto me, follow me, and I'll make you one of my disciples, and I'll heal you, and I'll help you, and I'll save you. You cannot just drift into a relationship to Christ. You must make a deliberate choice to accept Christ as your Savior and Lord. Another quote says, it is a deliberate, rational, responsible encounter with the Son of God. Stephen Alford said that. It is a deliberate choice, a rational, responsible encounter with the Son of God. You are not a Christian by osmosis from your parents. You don't become a Christian because your parents are Christians. No, you don't get it that way. Just because they were saved, if your grandmother and grandfather were saved, doesn't make you a Christian. Being born in Christian America does not make you a Christian. You must make your own deliberate choice, responsible choice to choose Jesus. Christianity is a choice. It is a deliberate choice where you trust Christ for yourself and for your own salvation. It's a deliberate choice. It's not by chance. You don't just drift into a relationship with Christ. You have to want it. You have to want it. And this is what happened to the nobleman. He made a deliberate choice. He had heard about Christ and then he made a deliberate choice to go and find Jesus Christ. If you seek me, God says, you'll find me. If you seek me with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your being, you will find. If you want God, you can find God. This nobleman made a deliberate choice to find Jesus Christ for his problem. And that's exactly what you must do. It doesn't just happen. It's not a happenstance. It's not by osmosis. And you just don't suddenly drift into a religion. No, first of all, you make a deliberate choice to go and to find whatever it takes to find Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us a parable uh, of finding that pearl out in the field. He sells everything else he has, all the other gems he has, in order to find that pearl of great price you must give your all to seek God. If you want to know God, you have to really want and desire to know God. Have you made a deliberate choice to go and to find Christ for your problem, your situation? So he heard about Christ and then he came to Christ and then he asked Christ, this nobleman in our story, he asked Christ to do something about his situation. The Bible says he besought him that he would come and heal his son there in Capernaum. Basalt means to ask, to besiege, to entreat, to pray earnestly. 
God come. Jesus said to him, hey, all you want to see is signs and wonders. That's all you want. You want to see another miracle like everybody else. No, Father, no, no, no. Please come. If you don't come to Capernaum, my son is going to die. And Jesus saw that his heart was clean and pure. And he had one desire, and that was for his son to be made well. And he said to the man, go, your son is well. Your son is healed. You can leave now. Now, this nobleman thought that Jesus was going to follow him back from Cana, 20 miles north to Capernaum on the top part of the Sea of Galilee. But no, Jesus says he spoke the word of faith and says, your son is healed. You can leave now. You can go. And it seems like the Bible seems to indicate that the man spent the night there. The next morning he took off going back to Capernaum and there was a group from his house. Some of the servants and slaves came to him uh, to tell him the good news that their son, his son, had gotten well. And they saw a smile on his face and they said, well, where's Jesus? And he's not here. He's already spoken the word of faith. And so this nobleman says, hey, when did he start getting well? Oh, about seven o'clock last night. And the nobleman said, that's the very time that Jesus whispered in my ear, your son's going to live, your son's going to be okay. You can leave now, you can go back home to Capernaum. And Jesus spoke that word of faith and that son was healed. So he asked Christ earnestly for Christ to do something in his life. And Jesus intervened. Mark the 11th chapter, verse 22 Jesus tells his disciples, have faith in God. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to the mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen. That's what Jesus did. It shall be done. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and you will have it and it will be done. So he sought Christ. He came to Christ, he asked of Christ, and God intervened in his life. The last thing we see in the miracle of the nobleman's son is the decisive choice that this nobleman made, made when he saw his son being healed. John 4, 48. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will not believe. The royal official says, Sir, please come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, You may go. Your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. The man showed that he had faith in Jesus' word that his son was going to be healed. And part of faith, a big part of faith, is obedience. He obeyed what Jesus told him to do. And that was, go home, your son is okay. You remember the story there in 2 Kings, the fifth chapter. Naaman had leprosy. A young Israelite, young girl says, I wish she could go and see uh, one of the prophets in Israel, Elisha. And when he meets Elisha, he tried to give him all kind of money and all kind of goods. And Elisha said, I don't want any of that. But if you want to be healed of your leprosy, this is what you must do. You must go down to the Jordan River and dip seven times and you may be healed. You'll be healed. The man started picking up all of his things and going back home to Syria. Man, the, uh, the streams and the pools in, in Syria are a lot cleaner than this old dirty Jordan River. Why should I go dip in the Jordan River seven times? And he started to go home, but his servants had more wisdom. Well, if he had asked you to do something great, would you have done it? Yeah, I'd have done something. Yeah. Instead, he tells me to go down the Jordan River. And finally, the servants get this man, this, this nobleman back in 2 Kings 5 to obey the words of Elisha. And he went down to the Jordan River. And he dipped seven times. And he, when he came up the seventh time, that leprosy that takes away all your skins and you have sores that ooze with, with pus and out of the sores, it's just nasty looking. They have to wrap those up. There's, a, there's one leprosyum in America. And I've been there. They wrap those, the, the end of their fingers up, the end of their ears, their nose, their toes. 
because of the sores that are on them. But when he dipped into the Jordan River, he came up the seventh time. It was like baby skin. His skin was restored totally. And when you obey what Christ is telling you to do, that's part of faith. This man went back to his room. The next morning he went home because he believed the words of Christ. You can go home. Your son's made well. Go on back home. Take care of him. He's okay. He's going to be well. He obeyed the words of Christ. And when he did, that son was healed. But the question today is, have you obeyed the words of Christ? Have you come to a point in your spiritual journey that you realize that you're a sinner, that you're lost, that you're going to be separated from God, not only now, but forever. And you realize that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is what makes atonement, a covering for our sins. And now you're ready to come to Christ and not trust your own righteousness, but to trust his righteousness and his work on the cross that justifies us before a holy God. Justified means to be made right, to be declared righteous. When you trust Christ as your Savior, immediately God declares you righteous. If, if you truly trust Christ as your Savior in your heart and you outwardly indicate that, you confess Christ openly. He says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you in heaven. But if you confess me before men through believer's baptism, through identifying with Jesus Christ, he says, I will identify with you in heaven. I will declare to the world that you are my son. And uh, it'll be a glorious day when you face the judgment of God if you have truly obeyed Christ. Not only believe that Christ is the Savior, but you now have identified, you've trusted Him in your heart and openly you have confessed Him as your Savior. Have you obeyed Christ? Have you done that? Have you done that? Now, if you said that you were not sure if you died today that you would go to heaven, I want you to pray this prayer with me. God wants you to be sure. Pray it right now. Dear God, I know you love me because you sent your only begotten son. And I realize that he was perfect and he died for my sins. I take you, Jesus, to be my personal savior. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart and be my Lord and be my savior from this day forward. And I wanna thank you, God, for saving my soul. Now, if you prayed a prayer like that, we'd love to hear from you. There's a number that's on your screen. We want you to call that number. We have some material that we can send to you, a Bible that we can send to you free of charge. So call the number that's on the screen. Most of all, we'd love to see you in worship with us this Sunday at 11 a.m. May God bless you.